am about to show you how that we make our paint palette here. This is gonna be a fun little fusible project. Hopefully you will all enjoy it. Um, with this, we're gonna start with the background here or the palette here and do some tracing and then we're gonna go through how we're gonna fuse all this together. So I have pre-cut a lot of my fabrics and I have um, already taped a few things together here as far as my templates go. Now, one of the things that I'm going to need is my template here for my palette. You can see it's just slightly bigger than my work surface, but we're not gonna let that bother us. We can move the paper to make it work. Now, if you need to, you can tape this down um, to make it, you know, so that it doesn't move. But if you trust yourself, then don't worry about it. So I am going to do this so that um, I can see my lines and I'm going to trace this here. You may not be able to see it, but I'll be able to see it um, with this green line that I'm putting. It, this is a, using a sew line um, ceramic pencil here. Um, you can use just about anything you want to trace these. I strongly suggest you don't use a Sharpie. Um, these things will wash out, so you wanna make sure you test whatever you're using um, so that it'll wash out if you plan to use this where you're, gonna where you're going to be um, washing it in things. Mine is strictly going to be for my use, so I'm not so worried about it, um, but I don't want the, the, the green lines to show up on everything else, so I'm gonna be really kind of careful on how I do this. Um, I like this because it's it's heat resistant. Um, usually I use a um, air erase marker. I like my air erase markers because they just kind of disappear over time. But I'm gonna be doing a lot of pressing today and I don't wanna accidentally have that um, marker take hold on my um, fabric and become permanent. So all I'm doing here is I'm tracing through this. Um, you guys will probably enjoy seeing this when it's done, but I'm tracing my circles first, and then we'll go through this. I'll fast forward through some of this for you so that you don't have to watch all of it, but we'll make sure that you see all the important bits, and this is where I get to shift my fabric um, to make sure that I can see it all. Okay. Now I'm going to do this a little differently than you probably are used to the applique. Um, you're probably thinking, okay, well, why doesn't you just cut this? You're just gonna put these pieces on here, right? Um, no, I'm actually not. Um, I'm doing this a little backwards and that's actually what the instructions call for is to do this a little bit on the backward side. Um, and the reason I have you do it a little backwards, this is going to be my trick to this, is, um, we don't want to have to change our threads often um, to secure our applique. Because, you know, despite what, you, what everybody thinks, fusibles aren't necessarily permanent, um, depending upon the fusible you use. And so I like to make sure that mine stays put um, with a little bit of sewing so that we don't have to worry about that. Now, some of the fusibles you'll use are a little more permanent than others, but the, usually the web benefits from some stitching. So now I'm doing my tracing of the outside here. Okay, I'm not using a Frixon marker. Um, I am not, I, I use them plenty when I'm doing half square triangles and um, other things where I know that I am not going to have any of it show later. Um, but when it comes to marking on a quilt, um, I don't like to mark on a quilt with a Frixon um, because I have actually had, especially with batiks, I have had the Frixon um, leave white marks, not black marks, but white marks on it. Um, so, you know, it was, Frixons were meant for paper, not fabric, and the manufacturer will even tell you that. So, um, you know, you can use what you like, but um, I tend to use more the um, ceramic pencils, chalk, um, sew line markers, um, excuse me, the air erase markers, 
um, and sometimes even plain old fashioned pencil. Um, but there we go. So my next step here is I've got some fusible that I'm using and I'm going to make sure that my piece is well aligned here so that it is going to cover the area I really need it to cover. Um, I use my fingers often to make sure that I am where I want to be on my fusible. And then all else fails, you can kind of put your finger down and go, yep, I'm there or I'm not there. So I've got a little extra room over here I can use. There we go. That's the edge there. So my next step is going to be to just fuse this down. Most fusibles, like a hot dry iron, always double check what the manufacturer's instructions want you to use. So I always double check. I will see if this peels off pretty easily. This one's pretty tight because I didn't go all the way to the corners with this. So my, um, I'm using a Pellon 82. It's a, it's a double fusible. Um, it's a sturdier weight than most of the, the webs out there and it gives a little dimension to it. So my next step here is going to be to cut this out. Now cutting out the outer side, um, I'm going to do really quickly here. Okay, so my outside is done. I can use that for another project. Now I've got to cut these inside holes out. Um, and this is where the fun part's going to come in. Um, so just like you were going to cut out a hole for, say, a buttonhole or something like that, we're going to snip in the middle, and then we're going to cut through these. And I'm going to cut each of these out, and I'll be back when we're done. Okay, we're back here, and I'm going to cut this last one. And what I have done for all the rest of these, just so you know, is I kind of fold it in half, cut it in the middle, um, and then I take a straight snip just to the edge of my green line, um, which you can kind of just see right there. See that green line? And then what I do um, to make this easier for me is I actually move my fabric um, more than I move my scissors. Um, I've just found that that works better. I mean, I'm still kind of closing my scissors so that it's forcing it through the nips, but it's easier to cut and turn at the same time. Whoops. Of course, I show you the most difficult one, which is the last one here. But it's easier if you turn the fabric at the same time. Um, it kind of gives you an easier cut through this, as you can see. Um, you don't even think necessarily about it as you do it. But um, I have now cut all of the holes out. So we have our paint palette here. Doesn't it look really cool? Um, and the next step we're going to do is figure out how to make our little paint pots here. So with that, um, and I have already taken the liberty of, I took one piece of fusible and I put all my little guys on one piece of fusible and then fused it all together. To me, that was the easiest way to do this. So you can see I kind of have one piece of fusible there. So I'm gonna cut this apart just to make it a little easier to do each of these individual ones. Um, but it makes it a little easier. Okay, so with this, I'm going to show you with one of these how um, how we're going to use um, fusible or um, excuse me freezer paper. So if you haven't used freezer paper before, um, basically I traced this from our pattern, um, which was right here. And I want to use the bigger outer circle when I do this from our pattern because this is going to go under the palette. So I don't want any of the edges showing and it's much harder to hit a small target than a large target. So we're going to use the larger one. And then I am going to do this the easy, easy peasy way for me, which is these are the two inch circles. And it doesn't matter if a little edge gets cut off because guess what? It's going underneath and nobody's going to see this edge. So I use the freezer paper, I peel it up, and then, you know, I could just use these flat as is as squares. I don't really need to trim them because I've already got my circular thing they're fitting under. I just like the idea of them being a little rounder and then I'm not going to have anything kind of showing through um, that's not uniform. Okay, 
So I'm just going to go ahead and trim all of these up like so. And to remove your freezer paper, you can just pull on the edge and it peels right off. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make the rest of these and we'll join you in a second. Okay, so now we have put our design under our mat um, and that's so that we don't have um, any damage happen to um, my uh, wool table that's under here. So by having the mat down, it uh, protects that. Now, I have my image here of my paint palette. And so I am going to follow the coloring here that we're using. So in this, my black is at the far edge here. So I'm gonna put my black piece down. And then comes my white piece, um, just so you guys can see it here on the edge. So I'm going to put that piece down there. As you can see, these pieces, um, as we cut them out, are plenty big. I'm just going to try and make sure they don't overlap, to, you know, because then we'll end up with a bump. Um, the next color that comes up here is red. And again, if it pops out a little bit on that edge, not a problem because we're going to be trimming all that down again anyway. And then we kind of do our rainbow colors here. So um, I'm going to do my orange. Um, my yellow, my green, my blue over here, and then the last step here is purple, and we leave the thumb hole, that's what that is, uh, free. So I'm just making sure these are all kind of separated and they're not on top of each other so that we don't have any bumps. Okay, so we won't have any bumps. And now I'm going to take my fusible here that I, where I have made this, okay? And now I'm going to set this on top of these. Kind of cool, huh? Oops, I got to turn it one more side here. There we go. And you can see it's going to cover each of those effectively. And because I have a fusible on the back of this, these should all fuse together now. So I'm gonna take a little bit of time and let this fuse down. When you're doing your fusing, make sure your iron is clean so you don't have any sticking issues. If your iron isn't clean, cool it off, clean it off, take that time so you have a pretty project. Now, you may ask, why didn't I just put these little thingies on top? Well, there's two reasons. Um, and the two reasons are one, it, it would have been a little harder sometimes to aim and put these on top. Um, so that's one reason. It's the lamer of the two reasons. Um, but my real reason being, um, I don't want to have to change colors every time I'm securing these. Because um, that means changing my bobbin and everything else. Because I'm doing it this way, I can use the same bobbin because I'm going to stitch around the outside here and connect in with the palette instead of the paint. So that's why I did it this way. It just makes sure that I only have to use one, um, one thread change. So using one thread change is much more preferable to eight thread changes. So that's why we did that. So we're going to give this a minute to cool. And once it's cool, we're going to put our brush together. Um, and the brush will go on here, but we're going to put the brush together before we add it here. So let's move to the brush. Okay, so I needed a little extra fusible here um, for my piece. So I've added a little bit here and we've fused down quite a bit of this already. So we're gonna put this fusible under here. We're just gonna make sure he sticks on there nicely. Okay, so the reason for the extra layer here was so I didn't have a bump here. Um, you always wanna make sure though that you know your um, fusible is down pretty pretty well. Um, and that you don't have any sticking out from under. So you want to make sure that you trim that pretty well. So we're almost to the end of this. This hasn't been that hard of a project. It's been actually quite a bit fun. So as you can see, it's all fused together because it lifts up together. Um, I'm going to pull out my center piece. So I have my, my piece of backing fabric here or um, base fabric. Now, if you really are a stickler, you can put this under here to make sure that it's absolutely centered. Um, but I have a pretty good idea of where my where my piece is. 
Um, I can see kind of the shadow through the edge here and I wanna make sure he's pretty well centered. I cut my squares a little large so that if I have a, if I have a blooper, I can trim it up. Um, but make sure when you do this uh, that you have removed any threads or hairs um, before you get going. Now I'm going to fuse this down. And you'll note I am pressing, not ironing, as we go. Now you do have a choice at this point in time, after everything is fused down nicely, um, your option is you can start doing your, um, whoops, that part's not down. There we go. You can um, actually stitch this down now. That's up to you if you want to stitch this down now. I have a tendency to cheat um, because I don't like to do any more stitching than I have to, just like I didn't want to do any more fusing than I had to. Um, and again, um, I always double check, make sure these are down pretty solidly. Okay, it's down pretty well. So you can stitch them now or we can quilt as we go, which is what I'm gonna show you next. Okay, everyone, we are back. I am using a tan thread. Um, as you can see here, it blends in pretty easily with what I'm doing. And in my bobbin, I am using actually an ivory bobbin, um, just because the back is going to be ivory. So I have decided I'm going to layer this up now, and I'm going to quilt as I go. Um, and secure everything all at once. So I've got my backing and my batting. And there is a trick, if you hold this up to the light, you'll be able to see um, if you are well aligned before you even get started. Um, so I have held mine up to the light here and I had to adjust it just a smidge here to make sure that I'm well aligned. Whoops, I have to move my backing over a little. Um, because I want it to be, I want the batting to be all the way on the front here. Don't want to be too close to my edges, even though this is a little oversized, meaning I have left room to trim the edges to 13 inch square instead of a 12 and a half, just because I want to have a little extra room. And so I'll hold it up to the light, make sure that everything matches up here um, before I get started and I'll smooth it all out. I'll check it again. And I am pretty well situated. So now some people like to spray baste at this point in time. There is no problem with spray basting um, if, that's, if that's your decision. I'm not a big one on spray basting and since I'm going to be working on the inside here, I'm just gonna do some straight pins on my corners because uh, my pins are gonna come nowhere, you know. My needle is gonna come nowhere near this. So I'm just pinning my corners here so that everything doesn't move too much. Um, on a block this small, your batting doesn't really move a whole heck of a lot here. So the stitch I'm going to pick, um, I'm going to, um, with my machine, I am going to pick a buttonhole stitch. Um, and that buttonhole stitch is going to be about a, uh, I'm going to do a 2.0, to do a 2.0, just because I like it relatively small. Okay, I am using an open-toed foot here. You can use whichever foot you desire, but I use the open-toe foot, um, mostly because it, uh, it will help me see where I am going and navigate a little bit better. Um, each machine's a little different. And so I am just going to start here. Always make sure you double check which way your stitch is going to go. So my stitch length is going to go to my right. Okay. Now the one thing I did not do and I should have, um, and it might not be too late, it's not too late, um, is I'm going to pull up that bobbin thread that's on the bottom. There we go. So that it is easy um, to see. Now I am going to put this into 
into quick time here so that you can see it get done. But here we'll take a few slow stitches and you just stay on the, the edge and move your material around. So let me speed this up for you and we'll go from there. So you can see where we are now. I have done some stitching around each of these so that uh, this actually has some good poof to it. Um, I will try and get a good angle of it so that you can see that. But you can see it has kind of some dimension to it now. Um, and the only spot I have not done my blanket stitch on is right in here. And part of the reason is this is really thin um, and a blanket stitch may not work really well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do some straight stitching here um, and just kind of do some thread painting um, and add a little bit of thread paint there. And then I'm going to quilt the outside to kind of pat it down a little more. And this baby will be done. Okay, so now what I'm going to do here is I'm just gonna do a little bit of thread painting right around the edge here. And I've picked a black um, just to give a little definition here. So I'm uh, gonna pull my th first thread up here so that it, um, there we go. Now, as you can see when I'm pulling this up, I have used, I am using a, a bobbin that's pretty light. Um, and that's okay, because I don't mind if this isn't, you know, if it, it, it looks a little lighter here. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go around the edge here, right on the edge of this. Okay, and this is again, just to hold it still. I'm going to do a little bit of, of needlework here on my um, on my brush okay and I'm actually going to do a little bit more on it than than I normally would and that's because I want to give it a little texture okay so we're gonna as you can see here there we go put that back down and because I've got the light colored bobbin it's going to actually give it some of that extra texture on here because you know our um, our brushes are not usually one color right so this is going to kind of help us with that little bit of dimension here um, and give it a little bit of a pizzazz so now I'm going to go right along the edge again and again just to hold down my my metal piece Right to the edge there. Okay, and I'm going to come across this edge here. All right, and I'm going to come back down here just a little bit. And you can see I'm actually doing a little bit of an outline here. So I'm going to come back here and just continue this outline around the edge of my brush. And again, it's just to give a little definition because this is my brush. And it's kind of a close color to the palette. Now, if you want to use this slightly darker, you might not have to do this, but I want to give a little definition. Just a little bit, not a lot. And you'll see it as I turn it around, how nice this is gonna look. See, so isn't that give a nice definition there um, on this side here? And then we're just gonna come back down this side. And again, it's just to provide a little definition here, a little highlight. And so those of you who like to play with markers and whatnot, this is kind of like taking that little fine micron pen around the edge, right? There we go. And then just because I want to do one little more thing, I'm going to kind of put a little bit, one more on here. You know how that metal band usually comes across your your brush. There we go. Um, so with that, now I've given a little bit of texture, a little bit of extra, um, a little bit of extra to it. So I'm going to go bury my threads here, and then my last step here is going to be um, 
to do the quilting. Now, if for some reason, um, you know, when you went to do your stitching here, maybe you got a little off as you went through, don't worry about it. Take a fab one of the reasons I used the light color on this was because you can just take a fabric marker and kind of color it in. So when all else fails, you know, fell on the side of a, a light color um, and it'll give a little extra um, ability for you. So just some ideas for you. I'll show take a picture when we're done.